Again, we want to welcome everybody here tonight to our seventh installment of Kingston's Buried Treasures. Uh, we want to thank you all for coming. The, the series gets bigger and bigger, and we appreciate uh, your patronage, and we appreciate being able to spread the word about some of Kingston's buried treasures. And uh, tonight is a very appropriate subject, because when you think of Kingston, what do you think of? Bluestone. No. Bluestone. Bluestone. No. No. You, you think of pre-faded, acid-washed cargo shorts, right? <laughs> and that brings us to our subject tonight. As Ezra Fitch, the Fitch and founder of Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, uh, Kingston resident, he actually lived right in the corner of Maiden Lane and Fair Street. And our s presenter tonight, we are incredibly uh, proud to have. Uh, everybody here, I'm sure, knows Ed Ford, our Kingston City historian. We have an overflowing crowd tonight because for anybody who is interested in the history of our area, Ed is a rock star. Ed is. <laughs> And I'll tell you that whenever I'm uh, discussing history with somebody and I say something, they say, that can't possibly be true. And I say, well, Ed Ford told me that. <laughs> and that stops the, the conversation right there, whether Ed told me or not. So Ed, I apologize. <laughs> I, I do use that. So we are, we are very, very fortunate. Ed really is, uh, he is truly uh, one of Kingston's treasures. He really is. Uh, for, not buried. <laughs> Not buried. Ed, I mean, Ed, Ed really fought the good fight to save Kingston's, the legacy of our history, for many years when he was the only one doing it. And we owe him a debt of gratitude that we could never pay. Uh, and it is, he's been a wonderful help and inspiration to me. We're proud to have him. And Ed, as uh, Hugh Reynolds just informed me, uh, Ed is the only presenter we have had that was alive when the subject was alive. <laughs> so Ed is very proud of that. So without, out, without further ado, uh, I'd like to present Ed Ford, our Kingston City historian, and our featured speaker tonight on Ezra Fitch. Thank you, Paul. Well, you're lucky tonight. There are two Ezra Fitches. So I know you paid a lot to get in here, but you're going to get you're going to get twice as much for your money <clears throat> as you would other ordinarily. So excuse me, I got to make sure I'm all set here. <clears throat> I think so. <clears throat> um, there are two Fitches, there uh, Ezra Fitches. One was the grandfather, and the other was the grandson. So I uh, debated on uh, which one to talk about first, and uh, that was. Uh, I looked in my old uh, file, clipping files of uh, old newspapers, and I came up with a little uh, story, and I think that'll uh, help me. Um, years ago, uh, a farmer and his son were out in the field uh, clearing the land for a crop and uh, removing stones from the site. And out in the middle of the a lot, they ran into a great big stone that they couldn't move. So the farmer said to his son, go to the barn and fetch the horse. So the son said, all right. So he started out and he got about halfway to the barn and he called back to his father and he said, which horse do you want, father? The old horse or the young horse? And so the farmer said, well, you know my motto, use the old things first. So the young man started to come back to his father and the far farmer said, well, what are you coming back here for? He said, I know your motto, so you go and fetch the horse. <laughs> so we'll start with Ezra Fitch the first. Uh, he was born in 1805 in Kentucky, New York, and um, came down here uh, when the, uh, down to, I say Kingston and Wilbur, uh, when the uh, Delaware and Hudson Canal started in 1828. And uh, he had two uh, relatives with him. And one was uh, Roswell uh, Reed, Reed, and uh, he was, uh, and also another one, Theron Skeel. And they were all from Cooksaki, all in the freighting and, and shipping business. And they came to uh, Wilbur 
to see what they could uh, uh, do in that particular site. They were uh, they were going uh, the the reed and um, scale were running. Uh, you no, know, as scale and, uh, and scale was running in the dock. Uh, reed and uh, Fitch were running uh, uh, ships up the uh, uh, Hudson River and down to New York, and also. Uh, having sloops on the uh, on the Roundout Creek and canal boats on the canal, so in 1829 um, the first steamboat came up to Wilbur, and you probably wonder why they didn't land in Roundout instead of uh, Wilbur, but the Broadway Hill, which is so steep, uh, was a hindrance to uh, horses and heavily laden wagons, and they just couldn't traverse that. And so Wilbur Avenue became the uh, transportation uh, area for uh, all the, mostly all produce. And Wilbur started to grow up into a thriving community. It was first called Twelfthville Landing, and Twelfthville, named for the brook that goes uh, along Wilbur Avenue, was uh, named because uh, the Dutch, when they came here, they would find fish in some of the streams that they didn't understand or what they were. They didn't see them in Europe. And so they would na number them. And they numbered uh, uh, the uh, bass that were in the uh, creek there at the uh, roundout, the Twelfthill Creek. Twelfth, uh, twelfth, the twelfth is uh, Dutch for uh, twelve because there were six stripes on each side of, the, uh, of a bass fish. And that, so that was called, uh, the landing was called Twelfthville Landing. Then it became uh, Wilbur when a uh, developer came in uh, 1830 and bought up a lot of land, but he uh, didn't last too long. He uh, uh, went bankrupt, and so some of this land went on to some of the other people. And Theron Skeel, who was an uh, in-law of uh, Ezra Fidge and Roswell Reed, uh, owned the dock that uh, was right where this, uh, uh, as you can see, the site of the uh, where the uh, bluestone uh, industry came later. And uh, so Ezra Fitch decided that uh, it was time in early uh, 1830s and beginning of 1840 to um, have a, a Bluestone uh, yard, and he started out there with uh, uh, Reed. Apparently, uh, uh, owned the uh, uh, Reed uh, owned the uh, land along with uh, Fitch, but Roswell uh, Reed never did take part in it. But Ezra Fitch, uh, with his brother Simeon and his uh, cousin William B. Fitch. Uh, started the bluestone industry that came down on the uh, on the creek. Now let's see if I can do this. Well, that's the picture you got, right? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I'll tell you about that. Uh, this picture and the sheets that you have all came out of the 1875 Beers Atlas, and the original atlas is. Uh, twice as big as that sheet. In other words, that's 11 by 17, 22 by 34. Great big picture. But I was absolutely amazed when I looked at that uh, picture, uh, that engraving with a magnifier to see that you can almost see expressions on the faces of some of the men that that man had uh, drawn for that. And I looked also to see if they would tell you who did the illustration, but they didn't. And I'm sorry about that, because I think that was a work of art, to say the least. So anyway, that was the beginning of the bluestone industry. Well, very shortly, uh, Ezra Fitch decided that he needed a uh, boat, and he uh, had built a boat, and he called it the Santa Claus. Why he wanted to uh, call it that, I have no idea. He wanted to kind of call it St. Nicholas in the beginning, but somebody else had that number, that name. So he had to, uh, he resorted to Santa Claus. So he hired a very renowned uh, artist, John Vanderlyn Jr., the nephew of our famous John Vanderlyn, to uh, 
paint on the uh, paddle boards on the side of the boat. You know, it had the big paddle wheels on the side that were covered up. So we had those uh, uh, painted. And uh, and here's some of the things of what they uh, what he what he had put on there. I don't know if there's any existing painting of that because it was so early that there didn't seem to be any photography. But um, when he started, he uh, he put uh, a, a tile roof, a chimney, down which Santa Claus was about to descend, with toys bulging over his shoulder from his ample pack. And nearby was a sleigh with its team of reindeer. The painting on the other panel showed Santa Claus in a room in the house about to ascend the chimney after filling all the children's stockings. And in the salon hung a painting of the jolly old man about to descend the chimney all over again. Then as it changed, atop the pilot house was a figure of Cupid with his bows and arrows. Now whether he was delving into Valentine's Day, I don't know. But uh, that was maybe a reminder that Christmas was the season of love. So Ezra Fitch ran that boat for probably 10 years, and then he sold the Santa Claus to Thomas Cornell in 1853. And that boat was uh, put together with another boat and combined, and I think that was probably the end of the drawings and everything on the uh, Santa Claus. But across the street, from the Bluestone Yard, Filch, Fitch, excuse me, Fitch uh, built a large three-story frame building, and he called it the Santa Claus Hotel, and that's where the crew would stay when they were not in port and they were not out on the, on duty and on the boat. And so uh, I heard I heard from a man about maybe 30, 40 years ago. Time flies but 30, 40 years ago, who lived in there. And his name was uh, George Tong. And he told me that his ancestors had lived in that hotel there and had bought it. And so I said, uh, well, I'd like to meet you sometime, but I never met him. But I said, what's your wife's name? He said, Tilly. I said, oh, Tilly Tong. And I said, well, what a name for you. <laughs> But well, I didn't say that to him, of course. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, that was the only connection I had with that building was torn down probably in the 60s or 70s by the Lawless family, who I think were related to the Berardis that uh, did the Bluestone building. Um, then, uh, let's see. Uh, now, as for Fitch, uh, retired in Kuksaki in 1854, and his brother Simeon now ran the Bluestone office in New York, while his cousin William B. Fitch uh, conducted the Wilbur Bluestone operation. In 1870, the office for the uh, Bluestone was built, and um, that's what it looked like, and it was called at the time and only cost $10,000 for that building, that it was the finest office building in Ulster County. And it was all designed by noted architect in Kingston and Poughkeepsie, J.A. Wood. As some of you know some of those. He, the J.A. Wood designed, for example, the Albany Avenue Baptist Church. The, uh, he did over uh, St. Joseph's Church when it had been an armory after the Civil War. Uh, for the cat to become a Catholic church. Uh, oh, several, the armory that uh, was in Midtown Broadway. Oh, lots of things. J.A. Wood was the designer of that, and he was the designer of uh, this building as well. <clears throat> the Fitch Bluestone industry kept building up, and uh, let's see if I got another picture in here. Oh, here's another one down here. Um, uh, kept building up and it became the uh, largest uh, bluestone uh, owner in the in the whole area if not the whole Hudson Valley and <clears throat> excuse me I got to get a drink <clears throat> um, 
Well, the Fitches kind of passed on. Uh, Ezra Fitch, after he retired, uh, he died in Kentucky, in Kentucky in 1870. Simeon Fitch, he lasted until 1877, and William B. Fitch to 1890. But by that time, excuse me, by that time, the uh, bluestone industry was slowing down. Uh, concrete had come in to uh, replace it, and uh, things were pretty well finished by that time. And uh, the only thing I ran across was the two daughters of uh, William B. Fitch, Charlotte and Rebecca, who became, uh, were bells of the ball here in, uh, in, uh, in, in society in Kingston while they lived here. When they got older, uh, one was in a nursing home and the other one, uh, who knows where, they uh, sued each other because they said each one was taking too much money. So I think that's probably what happened to the money anyway. <laughs> After many years of uh, neglect, oh, I didn't know him. I, I, I thought I had another picture, but we'll go back to that one. After many years of neglect, the Bluestone office uh, building was uh, restored by James and Alice Berardi about around uh, 1879, something around that time. And uh, 19. not oh, I beg your pardon, 19, of course. And. Uh, I remember that they had an open house after they had it all done, and they invited everybody to come and look at it and see what they had done. And uh, I think it was something like 3,000 of us showed up. I didn't think you expected anything like that. And when you walked up the stairs, it was a near, quite a narrow stairway, uh, and it was right against the wall. The people coming down on the wall side were, were rubbing against the wallpaper, I think he had to replace all that wallpaper and replace his rugs on the floor because there are 3,000 people tramping in there. But I'm sure he was proud of uh, what he had there and we were thankful that we could see it. Was there anybody here that had uh, gone there at all? Yeah. Saw that? Okay. Am I right about that? Yeah. The way it looked? Yeah, it was beautiful. Uh, now we'll get to, uh, if I can do it. The grandson, and I'll put him on. Hey, this thing works. I, I, did, I never did one of these things before. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, that's some magic. Um, Ezra Hasbrook Fitch, <clears throat> grandson of Ezra Fitch, was born at Cooksaukee, Greene County, in 1865. He was the only child of Roswell Reed Fitch and Margareta Hasbrook. Ezra's mother died shortly after his birth, in fact, only a few months, and his father didn't remarry until 1873. So that meant that Ezra Hasbrook was a, a small, he was a baby, and uh, who took care of him? I don't know. His grandfather, grandmother, they were there maybe. Some of the family. It wasn't until uh, his father got married again in 1873 that he had a home uh, for, by them. And so uh, I thought it was kind of rough. But he grew up apparently in, uh, on his uh, grandfather's estate up in uh, Kuksaki and learned all about the uh, uh, outdoors and so forth and became very interested in it. Now I also, in this book that I looked at, commemorative biographical record of Ulster County, they had about the Fitch family. Uh, it was something. This the Fitch genealogy goes about back to Adam and Eve. I'm telling you. I, <laughs> my eyes glazed over when I looked at Edward the First in 1292. They're talking not not that he was a relative, but some Fitches were there during that reign, and uh, so I waded through all that and uh, I found nothing of any great interest. That was 1292 is 200 years before Columbus even got here. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, what I did find was that a Fitch widow and they didn't name her, which I wish they had, and five sons and they didn't name them either emigrated to Connecticut in, uh, 
in 1630, and that's where the pitches started in the, in the United States. Uh, actually, I been trying to find out if John Fitch, the inventor of the steamboat, was a uh, relative, and uh, of course they didn't mention that, so uh, apparently not. Uh, but at any rate, uh, that's enough for that for the genealogy. Ezra Fitch spent his early years on the Fitch estate, as I said, with his grandfather, and a teenager. He went to school partly in New York City sometime, and sometimes in Canada. His father, Roswell, was president of the Bay of Fundy Quarrying Company, which had a large line of schooners and, and steamboats and everything up and down the, uh, from Canada to New York City. Let's see if I got that. Here's going to take two pages. I'm sorry I have to sit down, but I don't think I could stand up for two, uh, for four hours like this is going to be. Now Roswell, his father, died in uh, 1888, and the next year Ezra Fitch went to California and engaged with a company doing general merchandise in the San Joaquin Valley. He was pretty sharp, I guess, because in a couple of years, two or three, he became manager of the company's stores and in the whole valley, a, a series of them. But in 1892, he returned to New York City to study law at New York Law School. And uh, you know, they say he said that he was uh, probably, uh, that's probably when he met uh, David Abercrombie, who had founded a small sporting goods store in Lower Manhattan. Now, Ezra was admitted to the uh, bar in 1895 and immediately opened a law office in Kingston, adjoining the Ulster County Clerk's Office. And I think I got a picture of that one. There, I, I think I got it a little late. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the a, a law office that he had uh, practiced in. It's, the, the building on the left is the old County Clerk's Office that was there before the county office building. It's there now. And that county, that was a, a solid building, that county clerk's office there was all uh, <laughs> cement and the granite. But anyway, that's where uh, Ezra practiced law for a while here when he was in Kingston. And uh, he um, met a man, another lawyer, that uh, he got along pretty well with by the name of James uh, Jenkins. And uh, the two of them decided to uh, do some uh, real estate, building some houses. So they did, and, and, and in the middle here, uh, 1897, Ezra had married Sarah Huntington Sturgis, and uh, they lived on Maiden Lane, corner of uh, Fair Street. And uh, so that's a great big house, a great big yellow house on the corner of Fair and Maiden Lane. Uh, partnering with uh, the lawyer James Jenkins, Fitz remodeled 23 Pearl Street into the Huntington Hotel. And I don't know if you remember that one or not. It's now a parking lot for St. James Methodist Church. And uh, so it was a great big house, great big hotel. It was kind of a, it was used by, early on by uh, rich people who retired and uh, we didn't, uh, they didn't, we didn't have any nursing homes like that, I don't think. But at any rate, um, I, with one man that lived there that I thought was was, was quite uh, interesting was um, Admiral Higginson. And I remember him going to the old Dutch church, stately man, who lived until the 1930s, 32, and I was a kid. And I can remember him stalking up the middle aisle and didn't look right or left at anybody. But he was uh, the uh, rear admiral in charge of the uh, Battleship Massachusetts and the Spanish-American War in the Battle of Santiago. And uh, so he lived there and his wife for about uh, 20 years in that uh, Huntington Hotel. Uh, now, Huntington was named for uh, Sarah Huntington Sturgis. That was her middle name. So that's where they got that from. And the ones that owned the uh, building 
where the uh, owned that same law office that he uh, practiced in uh, that I showed you before. Um, Now, you wonder what he did when he was here, so do I. <clears throat> he, uh, he did do, uh, they, they built several buildings along and around uh, Warren Street and Wall Street, but uh, I guess he got tired of it after a while. And But Ezra Fitch served for 10 years in Company A, 7th Regiment in New York, so he was there uh, back and forth. He was very active in everything pertaining to the military matters of the regiment. He was always an enthusiast in rifle shooting, having been on the uh, regimental team. He was one of a team of five, which in the winter of 1892 and three broke all records of rifle practice ever made in the 7th Regiment Armory. Whether that still stands, I have no idea, uh, but it could. It could. He was a 32nd degree Mason, a member of Kingston Lodge Number no. 10, uh, the uh, 7th Regiment Veterans Club, the Kingston Club, which was local here, the Round Out Canoe Club, the 12th Skill Golf, Golf Club, well, that'll please somebody because he was here 1892, 3, 4. They're trying to get the history of uh, back as far as they can to see if it's the oldest golf club in the uh, Hudson Valley, at least. And the other one was the Pansy Golf Club, whatever that was. <laughs> Maybe it's for sissies, I don't know. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> but after a while here, uh, by 1898, uh, Ezra and Sarah left Kingston and moved to New York City. According to the records, and Paul won't like this, but uh, it says that uh, he was uh, sick and tired of his uh, lawyer profession. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but he left his. <laughs> and, but anyway, he went back to New York and he renewed his acquaintance with David Abercrombie who had that small store in Lower Manhattan. <clears throat> and uh, So anyway, they became uh, partners. And uh, they, uh, they, 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 and they, and they called it Abercrombie and uh, Fitch. Now I think I got something there for this one. Well, I got him anyway. Now maybe I got, and uh, so they became partners and they, but they didn't agree. Uh, Fitch wanted to uh, expand. He wanted to uh, had ideas for selling things differently. And Abercrombie uh, just wanted to keep a small store and uh, cater to the elite and uh, specialties and uh, let it go with that. But so I, I looked up about David T. Abercrombie. I wanted to find out a little bit about him. He was born in Baltimore, Maryland in June of 1867. While attending at Baltimore City College, he majored in civil engineering and topography. He was a trapper, a prospector, a, 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 a top, top, he was a prospector, topographer, railroad surveyor. He was also an inventor. He uh, in, it was uh, his, an ingenious design of his of tents and aversacks and other uh, camping equipment. It was his love of the outdoors that inspired him to begin Abercrombie Company, a shop dedicated to selling the highest quality camping, fishing, and hunting gear. His clientele consisted mostly of professional hunters and, and, and trappers, but they didn't agree. So they decided to dissolve, and David Abercrombie sold Abercrombie Company to Abercrombie and Fitch to uh, Fitch. The store continued under Fitch's uh, tutelage, 
and uh, became bigger. Ezra Fitch was a determined innovator. As a result of his determination, hard work and will, what he created was no ordinary sporting goods store. Fitch was determined that the store have an outdoors feeling. Stock was not hidden behind cabinets, glass cabinets. Instead, it was displayed as if in use. He set up a tent and equipped it as if it were out in the wi middle of the wilds. A campfire blazed in one corner, of course, with an experienced guide always on hand. The clerks hired in A and F were not professional salesmen, but rugged outdoorsmen. Talking the, about their uh, was their pleasure, and selling was only perf performed at the customer's insistence. You know. <laughs> I got to think, isn't it like that in a big box store now? Don't you have to insist that you want to buy something and nobody's going to wait on you? <laughs> but at any rate, he started something there. Uh, by 1913, I thought I had a, I got a picture here someplace of, uh, wait a minute. That, that's when the Abercrombie fixed doors. That was one of the early ones. and. Uh, now this I get a kick out of. This was an early catalog in 1903 when they were still together. And <laughs> you, you probably can't see what that says. But there's two bad guys in the front, one with a pistol in his hand. And up in the back is a guy coming on a horse or mule with a, a pack and all that on another one. And so this one bad guy says, do you think he has any gold? And the other one says, he has better than gold. What's that? Uh, an outfit from Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> so that was a, that's one of their, uh, that's one of their catalogs. I only got one more, which was 1930, and that's all guns. And uh, that was after he wasn't even there. Um, But anyway, they put out catalogs, and the catalogs, their orders were flowing in. <clears throat> By 1917, Abercrombie and Fitch moved to Madison Avenue and 45th Street, where it occupied the entire 12-story building and had become the largest sporting goods store in the world. A log cabin was built on the roof, which Fitch used as, an, uh, as a uh, townhouse. Uh, next to it, he had a casting pool installed where fishermen could sample the store's uh, collection of uh, rods and reels. In the basement was an armored rifle range set up. There was also a golf school, a uh, floor dedicated to uh, perfectly set up camps, a dog and cat kennel. a and had a selection of exotic sporting equipment hot air balloons, yachting pennants, uh, portable trampolines, treadmills for exercising dogs, throwing knives, shirts of chain mail. You know, I often wondered where I could find a, a chain mail <laughs> shirt, whether I ever want one. Mate, what is that for, uh, for, uh, oh, for, uh, must be for a sport or some kind. And everything else, they had everything in there for falconry and whatever. So a &F outfitted many uh, hunting and exploration expeditions. Theodore Roosevelt and his trip to Africa and the Amazon, Robert Perry's expedition to the North Pole, clients after Fitch's retirement. And, uh, some of these were after he was gone, but uh, the store was there. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, Presidents Taft, Harding, Hoover, Eisenhower, Eisenhower, excuse me, Kennedy, Amelia Earhart, uh, Bing Crosby, Duke of Windsor, Howard Hughes, and Cole Porter even ordered his evening clothes there. <laughs> and somebody told me uh, Lindbergh, but I thought about Lindbergh. You know, he took that flight to Paris. I bet he didn't even have underwear on. He, didn't have some, he had a, a, a plane full of gasoline that he could hardly get off the ground. 
I wouldn't think he would want anything that was heavy or anything whatsoever. <laughs> but hey, we'll see. <laughs> now the first uh, Mahjong set, <clears throat> whoop, here's some of those clothing uh, earlier on, 1920. Uh, Joe told me to put those in. Uh, I don't know what they dated that. Is. Now there's another storefront. Uh, maybe that's the Fifth Avenue one. Uh, they say it's, I've never been in one, but they say the store is very dark, loud music, and uh, 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 <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what else. Oh, how about that one? <laughs> see what else I got. There's the Mahjong. The first Mahjong set sold in the United States were sold by Abercrombie and Fitch, 1920. Became a success, and Ezra Fitch uh, sent emissaries to China, to all the towns, to buy every mahjong set they could find. And A and F sold a total of 12,000 sets. Well, that was probably a lot for that time. And even had hit songs recorded about the maj mahjong fad. There are now mahjong cruises, tournaments. Mahjong, as of 2010 is the most popular table game in Japan, with eight million players. In Japan, with a total of 300 billion in sales. Uh, studies uh, by doctors in Hong Kong have shown that, the, uh, that Mahjong is beneficial for cognitive and uh, uh, memory, memory <laughs> uh, difficulties. So uh, anyway, that's the Mahjong theory and it was started by A&F. 1928, Fish retired from the business to enjoy his remaining years in the great outdoors that he loved so much. He died on his yacht in Santa Barbara, California, June 16th, 1930. Uh, his body was returned to this area in several weeks, and uh, and it, uh, he's buried in the Fairview Cemetery in Stone Ridge. And when the weather gets better, we're going to go out and see if we can find that and uh, see what it looks like. Now, Ezra Fitch is attributed with much of the company's growth in its early years. A collection of uh, now defunct upscale apparel and fragrances were introduced, and there was an Ezra Fitch clothing line, a uh, Ezra Fitch cologne, and Ezra Fitch perfume. In the late uh, 1960s, the store went bankrupt, and uh, bankrupt in 1977. Since 1977, the company has consistently kept a high profile in the public eye, due to its advertising, its philanthropy, excuse me. Uh, and its involvement in legal conflicts over clothing style and uh, employment practices. The company has uh, been accused of promoting the sexualization of preteen aid girls by marketing thongs to 10-year-olds and padded bikinis to 7-year-olds. <laughs> in 2011, in a no, that's in 2011. In 2004, a lawsuit the company uh, was in the lawsuit the company was accused of discriminating against African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and women. And you know what it cost them? Forty million dollars. <clears throat> they did because they were offering sales positions to white men whites and men, and, uh, and that was a class action suit, and that was 40 million. 2002, an A&F sold a shirt <laughs> featuring the slogan, uh, two Chinese men, Wong Brothers Laundry Services, two Wongs can make a white. <laughs> 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 They withdrew it. They had to withdraw that one. 2009, the company filed a lawsuit against Beyonce. Beyonce, I don't have a picture of Beyonce. <laughs> to stop her from marketing a fragrance 
named Sasha Fierce, claiming infringement on the A and F's Fierce trademark. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say what happened to that. So, <laughs> if it, if it, she might have had to stop doing that. 2005, Women and Girls Foundation launched a, a girl cut. They wouldn't call it a boycott, of course. Girl cut, so the girls wouldn't go in there to protest the sale of T-shirts with the slogan, who needs brains when you have these? <laughs> that was withdrawn the next day. In 2008, ANF agreed to give $10 million donation in Columbus, Ohio to rename its emergency room Abercrombie and Fitch Trauma Center. Uh, that was turned down, I don't think so. But I will ask you a question right now. What do you think of Abercrombie and Fitch Health Alliance? $10 million? I to think about that. So that's all I have. Do we have any questions for Ed? Yes, is the company still independent or is it part of a larger conglomerate? They had uh, merged and been sold out about three times since they went bankrupt. <clears throat> and they, I think the man that's uh, listed in 2011 and 12 is still in charge of it. And it seems uh, right through that particular era, era is when they got in trouble with their uh, advertising. But uh, whether they've, uh, they've uh, started to concentrate on stores across the, uh, in Europe and Asia and Africa all, all over. And so they've got quite a lot there. They did close some stores here in America, but they still have maybe a thousand stores left. So they're still going. And as I say, I've never been in one. Any, maybe I'll do that sometime. There's actually one in the Poughkeepsie Mall. Yeah. In the gallery. Okay. Do you have a question? <coughs> I am mistaken. I have the history of Abercrombie and Fish from about 1940 to 1953. Yes. And uh, if you look in the uh, city directories yes. for the 1930s, you see there, there are five shipyards listed for Kingston. Oh. And one of them was round out uh, boat builders, which was the man that ended up owning the, 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 uh, the stone building there. And it, it happened. My name is Dwyer, and we're long downtown people. Um, a man by the name of John Weber, the Weber's were a family here, but in, in the 1930s, they had, John Weber ended up being 50% stockholder in Dwyer Brothers. Oh. My brothers did not refer to my father and his brother Bill, and it belonged to the generation prior to that. And uh, he married the only daughter of Robert Dwyer, and Robert Dwyer had that house on Broadway that I, I pointed out to him one time. Um, anyway, the man's name was Lansdale. Christie. And I, I just happened to be looking, trying to find if he had any relation to the Christie that's now the governor. <laughs> but this, this Lansdale Christie, he was pals with John Weber. And I think it was Gordy. He was really a New York fan, but he came up here for business and they go out on a suit. John Weber was claimed to be one of the first uh, troopers in, in the area. No, he was certainly an early trooper, but whether he was the first under it, I don't know. But uh, after his father-in-law died, and, and I don't know whether he waited for his wife to die, but uh, he, he came down to the store one day and hung up his jacket, and he said, where's my desk? So they had to buy something for him to do. And they put him in charge to buy nuts and bolts for the, and lumber for the shipyard. Well, thank you, Peter. I, I did, Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Very interesting. You? There you go. Ed, are you aware of any No. No. I'm not aware of any. I looked in the directories. I don't find any at all. And i don't. not aware of any. I hope there are, but I don't know. Any other questions? It's not often you get Ed. Here, so his, believe believe me, he is he is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, no other questions. That's all right. Well, Ed, thank you, thank you very very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and and again. Ed is a, a, an unbelievable fountain of knowledge, and I will tell you from my personal experience, he avails himself to anybody who, who asks. Uh, and please, I'm sure, I will tell you, when I took the position at Commissioner Juror's office, I wanted to do a history of the courthouse for the jurors. It gave me an opportunity to call Ed Ford, who I'd known of for years, but I never had a, uh, I didn't want to bother him, uh, and I never had really had an opportunity. I saw that as a wonderful opportunity to give him a call. Ed had me over, sat down, and I will tell you, for anybody who has already been in, and if you haven't been in as a juror, you're going to be in at some point, uh, the, the presentation that I give in the history of the courthouse is based largely on the information Ed gave me. So Ed and all of our presenters, uh, are, are, they are a wealth of knowledge, and we all love history. Everybody here loves history, and the presenters especially. So ask them. This is what we're trying to do, is to keep the, our local history alive uh, and to give credit and honor some of the people who have come in ahead of us. I will tell you, I will not see Abercrombie and Fitch the same way again after tonight, <laughs> but that doesn't diminish at all what Ezra Fitch did. Uh, he, he did an amazing thing. Uh, he made one of the largest clothing companies in the world, and he was from right down the road. If he knew what they were selling now, I think he would be very upset, but that doesn't uh, dispute it. I also would be remiss if, not, if I did not uh, bring up this book, Street Wise, W-H-Y-S. This is a book written by Ed Ford, and I will tell you, if you are interested in the history of our area, there is no better primer than that book. The book tells you the stories of how each street in Kingston got their name. They're all named after people in our community. So he tells you a little bit about how it got its name and a little bit about how, who was living there at certain times. So it's a wonderful book. And if you're kind and you ask him, I'm sure he will sign your book. He signed mine. Uh, Ted Dietz also has a number of publications that are wonderful. If you ever get a chance, these are great books on the history of our area. Okay, um, I want to tell you uh, before we leave, if I can, I'll let everybody know our upcoming features. March 15th, very appropriate, we will be having a presentation on John Vanderlyn. 
We are in the Vanderlyn Gallery of the Senate House Museum. We are actually in the midst of the largest collection of Vanderlyn works in the world. And I don't think you'd have a hard time looking at that picture over there, the large picture, and not see that as a Hudson River School painting. Years before Thomas Cole uh, began the Hudson River School painting. So he was, during his time, he, was, he certainly remains one of the most important artists of our nation, and during his time, he was one of the greatest artists in the world. So Joe Tantillo, who's also a member of Kingston's Buried Treasures, will be presenting on that. And Joe, all the uh, media and, and pictures we have here, Joe puts together the PowerPoint presentations. Joe came up with the logo. Pat Murphy, who's sitting back there, actually came up with the name Kingston's Buried Treasure, which is a, a wonderful name. So please join us on March 15th. The next series after that, April 19th of 2013, will be a presentation on the history of the Ulster County Courthouse done by myself. So anybody with enough time, uh, free time, can, can become an amateur historian. <laughs> so I hope you learned something then. We hope you join us uh, for that presentation as well. Before we leave, I do want to just thank a few people who make this series possible. Uh, I want to thank Ed Ford, and all of our speakers that we have. Uh, they really give a lot of their time and their effort to help us. I, will, I love coming here. I learn more in the hour that we're here than I've learned you know, in my entire life on these subjects. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really want to do all the research. It's great that we're able to benefit from this. So please take the time and thank them. They do put in a lot of effort. Uh, the Senate House Museum, again, they allow us to, do, to have these presentations here. They're closed for the season. They open up especially for us, and they set up. So please thank them. Tom Kernan, Jacob is here. Uh, they really do a great job for us. Uh, Bob Rizzo, Bob tapes all of these uh, presentations. Bob spent his, uh, his career with NBC. He's a true professional. He does a wonderful job. And anybody who wants to get a copy of this presentation, Bob does make uh, those. So just contact Bob. You can meet him after. Um, there's a lot of people who publicize this event for all of us, and many of you, I'm sure, have seen that in some of these publications. Hugh Reynolds, who is always here, he's been at every event. He, in fact, modified his arrangements to be here tonight, and he always runs a, a big spread in the Kingston Times. So we want to thank uh, Hugh. Jillian Fisher, she sends out emails. Many of you may have gotten them. Uh, she has been wonderful helping us. Friends of Historic Kingston. They also put us up on the website, and they go out of their way to really help. They promote all of Kingston's history, and they really help us out a lot. Ulster County Tourism, uh, Kingston Community Radio, Kingston Happenings, the Daily Freeman Preview, all, uh, they all, you may have seen this event in their calendars. Walt Wachowski and the Civil War Roundtable, they also put up our information on their, uh, on their Facebook page. And we have a Facebook page as well that you can visit. Joe Tantillo has, crea has created that. And I also want to thank Kingston's Buried Treasures, because the people in Kingston's Buried Treasure uh, put a lot of effort into this. And it's really become a wonderful series, and it's thanks to them. Uh, Ed Ford, uh, we have Pat Murphy, Joe Tantillo, Ann Gordon, who's our Ulster County historian, Nina Posipak, who's the Ulster County clerk. She's not here tonight. Uh, Tom Hafe, who's one of our city aldermen. Um, and all of you. You know, we appreciate you being here. And as long as you continue to come and find it interesting, we'll keep doing it, because there is an endless supply of subjects in our community that have contributed not only, again, to our community, but to New York State and to the, to the nation and to the world. We've had, it's an unbelievable place we live in. I don't think you would find a place like Kingston in the rest of the country. I mean, Ezra Fitch, the man started Abercrombie and Fitch. He's from, he lived in Kingston. Not a, and some of these people have done amazing things and then came back here and lived here. They chose to, to make their lives here. George Sharp, a, a prior subject, an incredibly important person. He could have been anywhere, but he chose to stay here and make his life here. And it's because it's such a special place. And it's a special place because of these people and because of you. So again, we thank you. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope to see you next month.